I wanted to start by uh, going back in time. In, in June 1988, the Assistant Secretary for Policy on Family Benefits and Low Incomes at the DHSS, a uh, Mr. Hickey, I don't know his first name, seems to have been lost in the mists of time, but he gave evidence to the Select Committee on Social Services. The word poor, he told the assembled MPs, is one the government actually disputes. His point was, you will have heard it before, that in a wealthy, developed country like Britain with a relatively generous welfare state, poverty, being poor, meant something very different to previous centuries or indeed different parts of the world. And to, to describe people with enough money for cigarettes, a flutter on the horses and, uh, oh yes, a large TV in the living room as poor, was to do a disservice to the millions around the world who faced real hunger and squalor every day of their lives. Poor wasn't the right word. Statisticians need to define their terms. They need to know what it is they're counting, and they need broad consensus that it is the right thing to count. With poverty, there is no agreement on what they're attempting to measure or why. John Moore, the Social Security Secretary for whom Mr Hickey laboured, thought people used the word poverty when what they really meant was inequality. Others see it as a measure of deprivation, being deprived of essential items. There are those who regard it really as a measure of exclusion and inability to partake fully in society. A great many, of course, deny that poverty even exists in this country. So statisticians need to define their terms, and they also need to be objective. They're not there to take sides. It's a bit like being at the BBC. We don't have views. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I don't, I don't actually have any views. Uh, but statisticians are, 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 are not allowed to take sides either. And the P word is loaded with moral ambiguity and historical baggage, frankly. So let's consider its origins. The collapse of the feudal system, the enclosure of common land, and the reformation prompted a profound change in this country's relationship with the poor. With the church, almshouses, and the sort of traditional lords of the manor unable to provide for the needy in the ways that they once had, begging, destitution, and starvation stalked this kingdom. Amid fears of widespread civil disorder, the state passed poor laws that in effect moved care of the poor from charity to tax, and change the relationship between wider society and its poorest members. The poor laws attempted to mitigate resentment at the new tax by spelling out who was entitled and who was not entitled to state aid, enshrining in statute the concept of deserving and undeserving poor. The former included, among others, those who wanted to work but couldn't find a job. The strivers, in the, uh, in the language the pollsters might use today. Uh, they were entitled to outdoor relief, clothes, food, perhaps a little bit of money as well. The undeserving poor were the equivalent of today's skivers, uh, people deemed able to work but who chose not to. And so what we actually had was, was a situation where rather than blaming the poor policies for the extra taxes and the social strife, citizens were encouraged to blame and to demonize actually poor people. This was the birth of the underclass, the idea of a detached and dangerous group. The Victorians described it as the residuum, a group whose fecklessness and criminality threatened the law-abiding and hard-working majority. Culpability for every social ill would be routinely pinned upon this subset of humanity whose pathological behaviour was said to pass down through the generations. For centuries, politicians would argue that they were supporting the impotent and the deserving in our society while pointing an accusatory finger into the shadows. The outbreaks of looting and arson uh, that, uh, that spread across parts of urban England in the summer of 2011 were widely blamed on an idle and immoral 
underclass. That was the word politicians used. The warnings going back to the poor laws of how the undeserving might rise up in a tempest of flame and greed appeared to have come to pass. Poverty is a loaded word. Almost a quarter of people in Britain think poor, it, being poor is down to being lazy or having a lack of willpower. It's not only relative and subjective, it also includes a moral dimension. It's hard to imagine a term less suited for statistical measurement. There is, frankly, a powerful argument for giving up on it altogether. But we cannot and we must not do that. The fight against poverty is central to many politicians' demands for social justice, creating a better world. Poverty may have evolved in absolute terms in developed nations like the UK, but the concept, like the poor, will always be with us. In 1975, the, the Council of Europe described the poor as those, quotes, whose resources, material, cultural, and social, are so small as to exclude them from the minimum acceptable way of life of the member state in which they live. It was an early adoption of that idea of relative poverty that we've been hearing about this morning, and one which led over several decades to the established definitions that we've been hearing about this morning. Tony Blair walked into number 10 in 1997, promising to eliminate child poverty by 2020. David Cameron walked into number 10 in 2010, promising his party was best placed to fight poverty in our country and committing his government to the same goal. We won't achieve it, most accept that. But gone are the days when senior British politicians argue whether relative poverty exists. Relative poverty, though, cuts both ways, and I'm surprised we haven't mentioned this this morning. As long as a country is getting richer, so reducing relative poverty helps ensure that those on lowest, lowest incomes, incomes are not abandoned. But as, as a country gets poorer, Relative poverty tends to decline automatically as median incomes fall. The ambition to eliminate child poverty could be achieved by just making everyone a lot poorer. Ian Duncan Smith is right to point out the perversity of current poverty measures and targets. But equally, it would be a disaster if in trying to find alternative measures, we end up abandoning poor people and poor children. As the Secretary of State has admitted, there is no easy answer. So how should statisticians respond? Well, first, the relative poverty, po poverty measure must not be lost. For all its failings, it is a metric that we can look at over time, and it does offer, I think, powerful evidence of the, on the life chances and life experiences of those on the, on the lowest incomes. Uh, and I'm delighted that the government is uh, going slowly on that. Um, second, statisticians and journalists need to be alert to attempts to define other social stresses as the causes of poverty. It's been touched on a little bit already, but you know, family breakdown, one of the things that the, uh, the government says should be a sort of metric for poverty. Family breakdown tends to make people poorer, that is true but poverty may be the cause of family breakdown. Many of you are statisticians. You will know it cuts both ways. And talking of cuts, cuts to welfare can push people into poverty, but they might also push people into work and into higher income and actually get them out of poverty. Problem debt is often a feature of the lives of those on very low incomes, but is debt the cause or the effect of those low incomes? Worklessness, yes, another one on the list, may explain someone's low income. But as we've been hearing, given the low wages on offer these days, so may work. And lastly, I think statisticians need to work with politicians and others to come up with a better measure of 21st century developed nation poverty, a definition that can win public acceptance. I do think, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it, I do think the minimum income standard that Joseph Rantry introduced, what, seven years ago now, I think, I think that might offer a possible way forward. I think the Council of Europe, back in 1975, um, were on the right lines when they talked about uh, people being excluded from the society in which they live. You know, this is about decency. It is about decent lives. And we need to have a grown-up discussion uh, 
within that search for a definition about what we mean by poverty, a compelling story, as, uh, as Jill says. Um, as George Osborne and Ian Duncan Smith put it in an article they jointly wrote on the measurement of poverty recently, this is such an important issue, it is vitally important that we take the time to get it right. Thank you very much indeed.